In this video, we combine some of the most disturbing cave diving tragedies we've covered on this channel so far. From divers who got lost in the silt to divers who made a wrong turn and struggled to find their way out. If you enjoy watching these videos, make sure to subscribe to our channel for more exciting cave diving stories like these. One of the most important rules of cave diving is to make yourself aware of the present conditions of the cave diving site before embarking on your journey. Ignoring this could result in life-threatening situations, as we'll see in today's story. The incident in this story is one of the most disturbing cave stories we've covered. Manatee Springs history can be traced back 9,000 years. The original residents of Manatee Springs were the Timucuan Indians. The entire picnic area was once a Timucuan Indian village. The Timucuans chose this site because it was alongside the Suwannee River, providing them with a means of transportation and fresh water. The spring was named by William Bartram when he saw a manatee carcass on the shoreline of the spring. Manatees are large, wholly aquatic animals. They're marine mammals, mainly herbivores, and they're also called sea cows. There was an attack near Manatee Springs between 1835 and 1842 called the Seminole Wars, led by Major General Andrew Jackson. Many Seminole Indians were killed while the rest were forced to leave Florida. The area then became settled by farmers who harvested timber from the spring and cultivated their crops there. After the incident at Manatee Springs, the spring was sold to the state, and in 1954, it became the first Florida State Park. Manatee Springs is one of Florida's first magnitude springs, and the longest spring run flowing directly into the Suwannee River. Manatee Springs State Park is located in Florida about six miles away from Chiefland on State Road 320 off US 19. Manatee Springs State Park is a great place to have fun and enjoy yourself. It has a variety of activities to enjoy, ranging from bicycling to boating, camping, fishing, hiking, scuba diving, and wildlife viewing. The West Indian manatee, after which the spring was named, finds the spring a good habitat because of the reduction of aquatic plants in the Suwannee River as a result of tannic acid, which darkens the river. Since manatees are herbivores, they move to Manatee Springs, where they can get food and rest after they've traveled 23 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. In addition to manatees, there are also large numbers of American black vultures who come to Manatee Springs during winter. These vultures are not aggressive, and they're not afraid of humans at the park. The cave system of Manatee Springs doesn't belong to the most popular cave diving sites in Florida because of strong currents. It can make diving difficult and reduce visibility. However, Manatee Springs has the best conditions when other cave diving sites are at their worst. For example, when flooding of the Suwannee River occurs, the visibility in the Manatee Cave system actually improves. There are many sinkhole ponds in Manatee Springs. Unlike other cave systems, the main entrance of this cave system is not easily accessible because it's too restricted due to the high current. To enter this cave system, you need to go to the Catfish Hotel. This sinkhole provides a huge window into the side of the cave. From the Catfish Hotel, you need to turn right and follow the main guideline upstream. The deepest depths of this cave system are upstream of Catfish, which is around 90 feet. There are other openings along the way, Sue's Sink and the Freedman's Sink. Divers always traverse between caves. That is, they enter one cave and come out through another cave. Years ago, cave divers usually made their way by following Catfish Hotel and passing out through Manatee Springs Fountain, main entrance, a daring traverse in the high flow. Recently, the tunnels near the main entrance started collapsing. This made the holes much smaller, and passing out through these holes became more dangerous. Diving experts warn divers not to go through such passages any longer. Also, in this particular incident, the heavy downpour in November 2019 made the running water much stronger than it used to be, and the traverse became more dangerous and unsafe to dive into. 
Therefore, nowadays, it's strongly recommended to not turn left from the Catfish Hotel because the very strong current makes it extremely difficult to get back. A blockage at the main entrance of the cave system makes it extremely dangerous to attempt reaching there. Certified cave divers have died while doing this. Zhou Min, a 28-year-old woman, went on a cave diving adventure at Manatee Springs. She was a Chinese native. Zhou, along with three others, left China for Florida on November 24, 2019, with the purpose of diving. The four cave divers grouped themselves into two teams. The first team was led by Wang Yuan, who was a cave diving instructor and had over 500 hours of cave diving experience. Alongside him on the first team was Chen Qian, who had about 100 hours of cave diving experience. Zhou and Fu Shaiyu were in the second team, who were both newly certified as cave divers with about 11 hours of cave diving experience. The teams were led by Wang, the cave diving instructor, who was the most experienced diver of the group. He dove in Manatee Springs many years ago. He had traversed from the Catfish Hotel to the Manatee Springs exit three times. Since he hadn't visited the site recently, he wasn't pre-informed about the current situation of Manatee Springs and other water bodies around it. Things had changed from what they used to be. The cave had become extremely dangerous, more so than it was in those years of his past visits. But unfortunately, they didn't make any inquiries about the present situation there. They went with the mindset of the past. You should always ask questions about the present situation of things in any cave you have not visited for a long time. Conditions may not be the same as what they used to be. So for your safety, make inquiries before embarking on your journey, or at least when you get to the cave site. The two teams' dive plan was to exit the cave system downstream into Manatee Springs. The first team, Wang and Chen, entered the Catfish Hotel using their rebreathers and dive propulsion vehicles, or scooters. They connected the main rope and pushed against the water current upstream beyond Friedman's sink where they would turn around to join the second team. The purpose of this dive was to check the conditions of the route ropes and the Friedman exit. They stated that the visibility was not good. It was maintained in a range of 9 to 15 feet. However, they concluded that there was no risk of exceeding their capabilities and decided to push forward. They finished at about 1,600 feet, and the push took 35 minutes. Then, after ensuring the Friedman exit's safety and the surrounding area's circumstances, they advanced to 1,700 feet before setting down the first EAN-32 stage. EAN-32 stands for Enriched Air Nitrox. It's used to reduce the chance of decompression symptoms. The second team, Zhou and Fu, entered the cave system through the Catfish Hotel after one hour using LP-95 back-mounted double cylinders. They dove for a short time on their own and met up with the first team about 500 feet from the exit. The two teams would then proceed by following the Manatee Springs exit downstream from their meeting point. Team 1 planned to dive for 140 minutes and maintain an oxygen partial pressure of 1.2. Team 2 planned to dive for 80 minutes and maintained a no decompressions diving range. When both teams met each other, they checked their air volume and decided to proceed with both teams according to the plan. After five minutes, they arrived at the end of the knot. Wang reported that he had been there three times, and each time the light and shadow of the exit can be seen at this point. However, due to poor visibility, the exit was entirely black. Since they weren't able to see the exit, they used a jump reel to connect to the main line. At that moment, the depth was about 50 feet, as they went up the slope for about six feet, the current increased significantly. Wang was pushed against a wall, and the current at the top was too strong for them to handle. He held on to a stone to maintain his position, but failed. The strong current tore through his mask and rebreather. After 10 seconds, he started to choke and wasn't able to locate his teammates. He looked up and saw some light shining from outside the cave and started to move along the rock wall in that direction. The powerful current of the water washed him immediately out of the cave. 
As he saw that no one else came out, Wang tried getting back into the cave to rescue others from the strong current. Then he saw light signals from the second team, Zhou and Fu, to indicate that they were calling for help. However, at the same time, Chen, first team, was stuck in a bigger main hole. Wang tried to pull him up against the current, but failed, and as soon as he let Chen go, he was pushed to shallow water. Wang saw that Fu was also thrown out of the cave by the strong current. Fu was disoriented, but conscious. As there were still two teammates trapped inside the cave, Wang didn't check Fu's condition, and he directly entered the cave. Wang saw that Chen had become unconscious and his body was drifting with the current, though his regulator was still in his mouth. He also saw that Zhou no longer had her regulator in her mouth. Chen's scooter and lighthead were firmly jammed in the rocks. According to Wang, he had to move Chen away first to be able to reach Zhou. Wang cut the scooter and lighthead so that he would be free and he was immediately thrown out of the cave. By now, Wang hoped that someone would have helped his teammates Fu and Chen outside the cave, so he returned to help Zhou. Unfortunately, he was not able to reach her because of the strong current. Zhou's right hand and head were stuck in the gap of a small hole. Unfortunately, she couldn't pass through this small hole. Wang clutched her hand and a tremendous torrent of water continued to come out. At this time, he realized that he lost Zhou and was also worried about Chen's condition, so he decided to return to the surface. They found Chen downstream, and he was very confused, but was able to breathe again. However, they were worried that he may have developed water in his lungs from prolonged aspiration. They took him ashore and immediately called the authorities and notified rescue services. Wang again tried to bring Zhou back to the surface after Chen got ashore, but the force of the incoming water at the entrance of the cave prevented him from doing so for 10 minutes. At that time, he wasn't able to enter the cave due to his conditions. They could only wait for rescue personnel. In the meantime, Fu hurried to the park duty station to get help. About 20 minutes later, an ambulance arrived to transport Chen to the hospital for treatment. He recovered after medical treatment. The rescue workers showed up after an hour. The cave rescue crew made three efforts to retrieve equipment that evening, but abandoned it due to an excessive water flow. The rescue and salvage operations continued throughout the next day, from 7 in the morning until around 4 in the afternoon. They were unable to get her body out of the cave because it had been hooked by the rocks. Therefore, they forcefully had to drag it and the rocks pulled apart. This became another opening within the cave. After authorization, Zhou's buoyancy bladder was punctured to reduce water from dragging the body. The body was taken to law enforcement on site after they brought it to the surface. After the incident, the main line was removed from the Manatee Springs to the Catfish Hotel. In addition, a warning sign was placed there so that divers would not be harmed. Entering through Catfish Hotel to exit Manatee Springs is discouraged. You are strongly advised to go through other routes. On February 9, 2019, two Italian friends entered the El Dudu cave system with the intent of exploring this fascinating cave. However, they ignored the warning sign and didn't return to the surface after the set planned time. The El Dudu cave system is located in Cabrera, northeastern Maria Trinidad, Sanchez Province, Dominican Republic. This amazing cave attracts many people who come to visit it for various purposes. Except for visiting for speleology, El Dudu cave is one of the places where you can admire pre-Columbian art. Also, the revitalizing baths the humorous experience of jumping over rocks, and the delightful restaurants and hotels make El Dudu a place to visit. The name of the cave, El Dudu, happens to be based on two theories. The first is that there was a sect of people, the Taino, that inhabited the land where this cave is years ago. The Taino were Caribbean natives who lived primarily in what is now Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Haiti, Puerto Rico, the Bahamas, and the Northern Lesser Antilles. Many Puerto Ricans, Cubans, and Dominicans possess Taino mitochondrial DNA. This shows that they have matrilineal descent from the Taino people. 
The second theory held that its name originated from the uncertainty of the depth of the cave. There's a warning sign posted in white and black on the premises of the cave that reads, Stop. Prevent your death. Don't go farther. There is nothing in this cave worth dying for. Do not go within this point. This warning sign is to prevent people that visit the cave from going beyond certain points that have proven to be hazardous. Let's get into the cave specifics now. To access the water, which is about 33 feet, 10 meters down the cave, there are stairs made of cement, which you will climb down to the edge of the water. An admission fee is paid at one of the restaurants on the premises to be granted access to the cave. Upon entering the water area, on the left side there is a massive tunnel that is about 330 feet 100 meters long and has a huge air dome at about 164 feet 50 meters. There is a cavern line on the right side of the wall that has slabs and warning signs. Hold on to the line and enter through the constricted area into the cave's main line. The cave's main line is in the heart of the halocline. A halocline is a remarkably substantial change in ocean salinity at a specific depth. There is a large, tall main tunnel at the entrance to the cave, which contains many dark, tannic-stained ornaments. One of the columns of the cave is about 33 feet 10 meters high at the maximum depth of 66 feet 20 meters. While you are moving towards the end of the tunnel, you will see a steep slope that goes up. It's about 20 feet 6 meters tall. Here, there is a sharp left turn where you will see the air pocket that has fresh air. If you're not willing to turn back at this point, you will get to encounter lots of more fascinating features of this cave. This is because the fascinating features you have seen to this extent are just the beginning of the adventure. As you move on, the cave's height starts to drop. Then, you will see some unusual arrangements of dark stalactites. Stalactites are the minerals that form the substances that cling to the cave ceilings. The remaining part of the dive is shallow, about 20 to 23 feet, 6 to 7 meters, and there are no ornaments there. You will swim through to the end of the main line that leads to another entrance called Quaya de Lili. It will take you about 45 minutes to reach this entrance. So if you do not know how to swim, you should learn before you tour the El Dudu Cave. The sight of the living creatures makes this place more fascinating, so there's a great need to be extremely careful. This is a home for some wildlife such as snakes, bats, and cave creatures like tarantulas and whip scorpions. You will again swim to the exit, taking the left side around the cenote. Dive into the cavern, which contains two more tunnels that lead to the third entrance, Oza de los Coballos. This cavern is magnificent, and diving this far will leave you in awe of its beauty. You will see the special colors of water and be astonished by the different shellfish. On February 9th, 2019, two Italians embarked on an exploration journey into the El Dudu cave system in Cabrera. The explorers were Carlos Barbieri, who was 57 years old, and Carlos Basso, who was 44 years old. Like most cave explorers, they went with the intent of exploring this fascinating cave and had a set time for exiting. They entered the cave at 11.45 a.m. Their diving in the cave was unnecessarily prolonged. At 2.30 p.m., two hours and 45 minutes after they entered the cave, they did not show up at the surface. Therefore, an alarm was raised and they were reported missing. It was revealed by one of the wives of the divers that both of them had experienced diving in this cave in the past. Unfortunately, they died in a seemingly familiar cave. What could have happened? Why would such divers lose their lives exploring the El Dudu cave system? Did they decide to flout the rules of the cave? Or were they trapped in the cave system? There was no definite explanation for their unfortunate demise. The manager of El Dudu, Jose Martinez, said, It was like the Italians ignored the sign posted at the entrance to the cave that warns about the hazards of diving in a cave without adequate international diving certification. Different training is required for successful cave diving than is required for open water diving. 
Not only are you going to be specially trained, but you will be required to have special cave diving equipment for safety purposes. Some caves require an internationally qualified cave diver certificate and experience before you are granted access. The reason is that at this level of qualification, they have received training that has exposed them to a variety of techniques and equipment that can sustain them in hazardous caves. These two cave divers may never have been exposed to such dangers. Since they were not international divers, they might have lacked the specific techniques and equipment needed in such a situation. We can't rule out the possibility that they may have gone too far into such a hazardous part of the cave. El Dudu Cave requires experienced cave divers because of the complexity of the system. Though many may go to some parts of it for tourist purposes, it is more advisable for only experienced cave divers to dive deep into those extensions. El Dudu Cave is about 82 feet 25 meters deep, with an extension of about 2,600 feet 800 meters. Such depth isn't safe for inexperienced cave divers. Rescue teams were sent into the cave to search for the missing cave divers. The team was made up of two leading experts from the Dominican Republic Speleological Society, Philip Lehman and Angel Compress. Working with these two were the Cabrera authorities and the owners of the Laguna El Dudu Recreation Area, and Sergio Yapola, who was a certified diver of the Auxiliares Navales. After several operations of searching different parts of the cave, on Monday, February 11, 2019, a corpse was found deep within the cave. It was identified to be Carlos Barbieri. His body was recovered from a dangerous section of the cave where massive sediments had accumulated, reducing visibility. This might have been the cause of their deaths. Once visibility has reduced substantially, there is a great possibility that you will not be able to find your way out. Anything can happen while you're struggling to find your way. You may likely exhaust your air since you are already staying longer than planned. You may also become weary, lose consciousness, or get drowned. A lot of risks are attached to a lack of visibility. It is advisable to avoid going into areas that are prone to low visibility while diving. The rescue operation was later suspended due to the reduction in visibility of the lagoon waters on Monday, February 11, 2019. The rescue team planned to resume rescue operations when the visibility was clear in search of the body of the second cave diver. Luis Carvalho, an environmentalist, propelled the Ministry of Environment to join the rescue operation and also to set strict security measures to avoid future hazards at the cave. When the operation resumed work, the corpse of the second Italian diver, Carlos Basso, age 44, was found on Tuesday, February 26, 2019. The rescue teams that went for the second rescue operation were the Dominican Republic Speleological Society, DRSS, the Center for Emergency Operations, COE, Civil Defense, the Red Cross, the National Police, the Ministry of Tourism, and many other bodies. In August 2012, a family consisting of a father, son, and daughter went on a dive adventure into the Twin Caves. Things took a drastic turn when they dived deeper into the cave and they started to kick up silt. Merritt's Mill Pond is located in Jackson County, some distance away from Mariana, Florida. It has seven springs spread over a four-mile-long pond, including the Twin Caves. Two connected but distinct caverns make up this spectacular diving spot. The northern opening is about 18 and a half feet, and the southern opening is shallower. Both openings are in a calm depression at the bottom of the mill pond, which is about 50 feet north to south and 25 feet east to west. Freshwater springs may be found in both caves, and they both have air spaces at the ends. The water in Merritt's mill pond is generally turquoise blue and very clear. The two openings are covered by this water, and there are some plants around them. The bottom of the cave is filled with sand and limestone, which can cause a silted cave when it's kicked up, as we will see in this video. In August 2012, a diver named Raymond went for a diving adventure into the Twin Caves together with his daughter Alexandra and his son. The father was an open water diving instructor. His son and daughter were just in the college age range. They hired a pontoon boat from Cave Adventures. 
The dive shop owner, Ed Sorensen, advised them not to enter the Twin Caves as open water divers, since it's only appropriate for certified cave divers. Twin Caves are prone to silting, and it is very dangerous for inexperienced divers to dive into the cave system. The three family divers weren't the only ones who made their way to the cave. Some other divers had been into the cave and were just coming out when they were about to enter it. They entered the water gracefully with not much difficulty as they were doing open water diving. But at some point, they decided to go further into the cave, neglecting the advice from the dive shop owner. As they were entering the cave, Andrea, a cave diver, her husband, and a diving buddy were exiting the cave. They were diving high up in the cave to reduce the chance to kick up silt, which is common at the bottom of the cave. Andrea saw the three family divers entering the cave, but assumed they didn't see her and her fellow divers. One of the things that can affect divers in this type of cave is entering the cave when others are leaving. Their activities would have caused a certain amount of silt within the cave, and this will definitely affect visibility. Alexandra was about 20 feet into the cave with her father and brother following closely behind when they passed Andrea and her diving group. Alexandra was carrying a single cylinder and a flashlight, which she used to light up the water and was amazed by the stunning view of the cave. As they were open water divers, they used the up and down flutter style kicks, which started to stir up the silt and within a short time, the visibility dropped to zero. She thought if she kept swimming, the silt would clear out. Unfortunately, it was getting worse, and suddenly the lovely family diving adventure soon turned into the worst case scenario when they found themselves in a life-threatening situation. Alexandra could not see anything, and she started to breathe heavily. She turned around to look for her father and brother, but she couldn't find them. She panicked and started to kick even harder, causing more silt into the cave. At this point, she couldn't even see her own hand anymore and got herself into a nightmare situation. When the silt filled up the cave, resulting in very poor visibility, Raymond lost his daughter Alexandra. He dove further into the cave, looking for her. Fortunately, he was able to find her and signaled her that they needed to get out of the cave immediately. However, due to the silt, they couldn't even see each other's faces. Therefore, Raymond grabbed his daughter tight and started swimming in one direction. No idea if this direction was the correct way out. Suddenly, Raymond felt a wall and started to move along this wall. While doing this, he realized that they could hit something sharp which could damage their diving equipment. This could cause an even more dangerous situation, so he adjusted his air tank and line to protect his gear. While doing this, he briefly let go of his daughter, Alexandra. When he finished, he reached out for her, but she was gone. He panicked, but thought she might have swum further in the direction they were going. So he also continued. Eventually, he was able to reach the entrance of the cave and surface safely. Unfortunately, when he surfaced, Alexandra wasn't there. Before Raymond left the cave, Andrea and her group were exiting the cave. They were swimming high up in the cave because of the heavy silt on the bottom of the cave. Only a few feet from the exit, something suddenly touched her arms and she saw a light beam in her face. It was the fins of Raymond's son. Andrea signaled to him to leave the cave and within a few minutes he was able to get to the surface. Andrea and her husband too exited the cave using touch contact since they could no longer see themselves. Their other partner exited the cave through another opening and the three met on the surface. The three dive buddies could only see the sun at the surface and asked what they were doing. The sun was in shock because he lost his father and sister in the cave. He told them their father knew what they were doing and they should call emergency services because his father and sister needed help in the silted cave. A few moments later, Raymond also surfaced and he swam over to them. He asked them if they had seen Alexandra, but they all didn't know where Alexandra was. Raymond was in shock when he realized his daughter must have gotten lost in the silted cave. They returned to the entrance of the cave in search of the young girl, but they were only making matters worse by causing more silt to accumulate. When they realized that their own lives were already in danger, they returned to the surface to call out for help to the cave adventures dive shop nearby. 
Luck shone on them because Ed Sorensen, an experienced cave diver and a great cave rescuer, was on Merrittsville Pond preparing for a cave diving class with his students at Jackson Blue Spring, which is on the same pond. Ed left Jackson Blue Spring, which was just a mile's journey to the Twin Caves. He arrived at the incident site in less than 20 minutes after they called him for help. He was quickly briefed about the location of the girl by her father before entering the cave. When he entered, he discovered that the Twin Caves had been covered with about a 60-foot circle of mud. But because he had several experiences in this kind of situation and has been diving in this cave for a long time, he deployed his reel and made his way to the gold line that's inside the cave, even in conditions with close to zero visibility. He began to search for the lost girl from this gold line, and a lot of thoughts ran through his mind. Of course, who wouldn't think wild in such a situation, where you know you are jeopardizing your very life? for the sake of others, but Ed had been known for diving in places where other divers wouldn't go, and he has always been successful in every one of his rescue operations. He promptly dove into the silt-filled cave, which was almost completely dark and everywhere filled with mud. Although he hardly saw anything before him, he continued to search for Alexandra, who must have been in a great panic. When a victim is in a panic state, it becomes more risky for you to rescue him. He tied off his primary spool and deployed a safety spool to start a zigzag search. He continued to dive down slowly, having the safety of the girl in mind. Just a few minutes into the search, he stumbled upon the girl who was standing in the silt. She put her head in a pocket of air at the top of the cave. The water in the cave was almost reaching her chin, and she no longer had a regulator in her mouth. Though breathing in air from this kind of pocket was dangerous, she possibly did not have other alternatives than to breathe from the air pocket she had found. Upon finding her, Ed told the girl to stay calm and hold on to his arms so that he could bring her out safely. She did just as she was instructed, and both of them made their way to the entrance of the cave. Upon reaching the entrance, they dove upstream to the surface. All that were waiting for them on the surface were greatly surprised at the speed of the rescue, which was just within 10 minutes. But at the same time, they were all filled with great joy that Alexandra was rescued safely. She was very cold and shivering, but she had no further complications. While alone in the dark, cold cave, the girl became very confused and almost gave up on her survival. She had no thermal protection, which could have kept her warm in that cold water. She had to devise means to keep herself warm by kicking and moving around. She was left with less than one-third of air in her cylinder. She thought she would drown as soon as she ran out of air, but help came for her and she was rescued alive. Raymond was sincerely grateful to Ed Sorensen, who had just saved his daughter from dying in cold, dark water. Alexandra, who was just a few minutes away from drowning and knew the agony she just passed through before Ed found her, also showed her sincere gratitude to her rescuer. She continued to send him letters of gratitude for several months, and her father offered Ed some money, but he refused it. Raymond later donated a huge amount of money to the Divers Alert Network. For the sake of safety, divers are advised to stay within their levels of training and to follow guidelines to avoid stories that touch the heart. The next video of this cave diving marathon involves Donald Cerrone, who got into one of the scariest scenarios cave divers can get into, kicking up silt and struggling to find a way out. What happened to him, and did he manage to get out of the cave before he ran out of air? Stay tuned to find the answer. On Friday, August 10th, 2018, Donald Cerrone decided to go for a diving adventure in Cozumel, Mexico, where he eventually faced one of his greatest fears. Donald Cerrone, aka Cowboy, was born on March 29, 1983, in Denver, Colorado. He is a retired mixed martial artist, an actor, and a former professional kickboxer. He competed in the Ultimate Fighting Championship in both the lightweight and welterweight divisions. Donald is married to Lindsay, and at the time of his cave dive in August 2018, they had a six-week-old baby boy. During high school, Donald started professional bull riding, and he also learned scuba diving. He began training in kickboxing at age 20, and he later proceeded to have a MMA career, where he got the nickname Cowboy because of his love of wearing cowboy hats. 
Donald is widely known for his daring stunts and styles and his love for extreme sports. He decided to go for a diving adventure in Cozumel, Mexico. Donald is an experienced cave diver who has been in the sport since his high school days when he was certified as a cave diver. On this adventure, Donald and his friend were in Cozumel to explore the area. They spent some days exploring the coral reefs and some shipwrecks. However, Donald and his friend decided to take the adventure a step further and explore a cave system known as Cenote El Aerolito. This cave has access to the sea. It's an ordinary looking body of water in Mexico that also happens to be home to a non-threatening crocodile. However, beneath the crocodiles is a vast underwater cave system that stretches for miles. For professional cave divers, it's a very unique and compelling dive site. Aerolito Cenote is one of the 18 cenotes on the island of Cozumel. Many of these are difficult to access, but Aerolito has a drive-up parking garage. According to Donald, his friend was one who taught him so much about cave diving. When he was about to leave for the dive, his wife, Lindsay, discouraged him because she believed they might get into trouble since he was diving with an older man whose skills were deteriorating. Instead of heeding his wife's advice, he reassured her that all would be well with them and that she should not be afraid. As he was about to leave for the adventure, Donald kissed his wife and his new baby goodbye. She kept repeating to him that she doesn't want him to go on the dive. But Donald replied, What are you worried about? He furthermore said, This is what I do. I come home every time. I'm coming home. Donald decided to order another air cylinder just to make sure everything was okay with them in the cave. The plan was to use the rule of thirds for gas management. So if they go in with 3,000 PSI, they'll use 1,000 PSI for entering and leaving the cave and 1,000 PSI for exploring. The remaining 1,000 PSI will be for emergency use in case of necessity. They entered the cave with their gear through the small surface entrance. They traveled with the aid of the guidelines that had been placed there by other professional divers to help other divers navigate their way within this cave. It's usually the custom of expert divers to map out caves with these lines because cave systems are usually wide and one could easily get lost. Apart from the guidelines, cookies are also used to mark some points within the cave to further provide specific directions within the cave. They needed to switch from one line to another at some point. His friend went first, grabbing the line and draping it around his neck, allowing him to make the switch with two hands. As he went to tie off, his buoyancy device, which is a small device that fills with air to increase or decrease buoyancy, became loose and clung to the cave roof. He then kicked up his feet and flipped around, and his line fastened itself around him. As Donald swam toward him to assist him in untangling the line, his friend began to panic. He started kicking viciously and twisting around, causing him to repeatedly hit the cave wall, simply resulting in the kicking up of silt within the cave. As a result of the kicked up silt, the visibility within the cave was reduced to the extent that they couldn't see themselves. There was a massive cloud that was forming underwater called a silt out. Silt out occurs when the diver's visibility is reduced to non-functional levels due to the disruption of fine particulate deposition on the bottom or nearby flat surfaces. Scattering the particles creates a sort of mist, making it very difficult to see where you're going. Such impairment is undoubtedly a huge issue when you're underwater, and even more so when you're trying to find your way out of a cave before you run out of air. When his friend realized he was in trouble, he became afraid, and fear is the worst thing anyone can ever have in this kind of situation. Fear alone can kill you, even though you have the opportunity to live. So Donald watched, within arm's reach of the main line, as his friend kicked around violently and decided to take the risk of rescuing him out of his misery. To make the situation worse, Donald, who was on a journey to help his old friend, also got into trouble as a result of the greatly reduced visibility. He was not able to see himself, not even with his own hands. Was it that Donald did not know the rules of diving? which according to him, stated that self-preservation is much more important while diving. This means that when a diver is posing a threat to others as they want to help, it's best to save oneself 
to avoid the occurrence of two divers' deaths. Why did he break the rule? As he looked at his friend, he also looked at the clear exit way that he could go through to save himself. But he couldn't just leave his friend in the silt-out water. Then he chose to abandon his exit and help his friend. For whatever reason Donald had decided to break this rule, he didn't escape the consequences that came with it because he found himself in trouble, just as his wife had earlier warned him. Donald's effort to get through to his friend proved abortive because as he entered the silted out region, he lost sense of his surroundings. He wasn't sure of the condition the man might be in at the moment, and he couldn't see his flashlight because it had gone off during the violent kicking. Donald also hoped that his friend hadn't dropped his regulator in this unfortunate situation. What will be the hope of these two diving buddies in such hazardous conditions as these? While Donald became lonely amid the silt after he completely lost track of his old friend, he lost everything to the silt due to lack of visibility. He lost his way, his present location. He couldn't find a way up or a way down. He was in total dismay. He also became very afraid. He was now panicking and breathing harder than ever. In his struggle to find his way out, he banged his head on the ceiling. It was then he realized he needed to calm himself down so that fear would not be the end of him. After pushing away fear, a viable solution came to him. He was able to see reflections of light from his two watches, but he had no idea of his precise location at the moment. However, he had little idea of where he came from, even though he didn't know where he was going. So this began to help him navigate his way through the non-linear structure of the cave. Donald continued a blind journey and he only depended on sensations to know how far he was going. Whenever he noticed he was swimming against or into the current, he tried to find his way back to what he considered the right route. Not quite long enough, he was able to lay hold of the main line. He was still navigating and hitting his head on the walls of the cave. He checked his compass because when they first entered the cave, he calculated the route of the exit from the first jump to be 126 degrees. This is a bit of a reach since you might be facing the right direction toward the exit in the cave's winding tunnel, but if you are not in the right section, that route may just lead to the wall of some other tunnel. Donald attempted to swim in that direction but ran into a wall. He tried to go lower, but he ran into another wall, which sent him back in full panic mode. He kicked and thrashed viciously in his panic, but luckily for him, he exited that section and came across the main line. Donald grabbed it, and although he was in clear water, that section was the wrong place for him to exit. He needed to pass through the silted up section to get out of the cave, which was nearly 3,000 feet away. He had no choice but to enter the silt and feel his way around until he came across a hole. He entered through the hole despite not knowing which way it led. He came across another hole that appeared familiar and decided to swim into it. However, he noticed that he was swimming against the current, and when they entered the cave, they were also swimming against the current. This indicates that he was swimming in the wrong direction. He panicked and returned to the main line, which was in the opposite direction of the silt. All he could think about as he sat there hyperventilating was the words he told his wife and baby, I'm coming home. He was still breathing hard and his air cylinder was running low. Different thoughts started flooding his mind and he thought he might take his last breath within the cave. In his panic, he remembered that he had just about one hour of air left in his cylinder and he was far deep in the water. At that moment, it was clear to him that he might later drown. In search of an exit from the ceiling of the cave, he tried to rig his buoyancy control gadget to lift him. He grabbed his buoyancy device and started breathing into it to fill it up completely. With it full, he shot up to the ceiling of the cave and rested upside down, still thinking of his family. Now Donald thought if he ran out of air, he would breathe from his buoyancy device till he drowned. And drowning was one of his greatest fears. However, as a fighter, it was wrong for him to quit at this point. He was rekindled in hope and he was determined to find a way out. He began crawling upside down along the cave ceiling. When he remembered that there was a big crack that went through the top of the cave, he decided to look for that crack. When he found it, he followed it until he saw a light through a twisted hole. But he couldn't go through the hole because his tank got stuck. So he still panicked and continued through the crack until at last he found his way out. 
This is a victory for a determined soul like Donald, who despite being in a dreadful and difficult situation, refused to give up. And it was as if the thoughts of his wife and baby kept him inspired till he found his way out. Surprisingly, his friend had gotten out too. How did this happen? It turned out that after being stuck in the silted out section, his friend had managed to grab hold of the percent line and follow it out of the cave. Donald told his friend that he had had his last dive with him. Donald then texted his wife, had a bit of a scary moment today, but I'm coming home. Donald said he continually had a series of nightmares of being lost in the cave because that experience was one of the toughest he ever had. He was happy to be alive at the end of the dangerous experience that he described in his post as a catastrophic worst-case scenario. The Blue Hole of Santa Rosa, New Mexico It's a circular bell-shaped lagoon with a difference and a destination for prominent divers. It's also a great place for lovers of outdoor activities. Though its recreational center is appealing to the general public, the underwater cave has proven to be unique and very dangerous, as we will see in this last story of the marathon. This blue hole is located in the south of Santa Rosa, New Mexico. Like its name, the water has a bluish color like that of the sky. The temperature of the water never changes. It's always 62 degrees Fahrenheit, and about 3,000 U.S. gallons of water flows into the Blue Hole every minute. A rather fascinating feature is that the Blue Hole increases in size down the depth. That is, the top of the lagoon has a diameter of about 80 feet, while the bottom is about 130 feet. The water springs out from underground water, deep below 200 feet from the west of Ogallala Aquifer. The major lagoon's depth is above 80 feet. The Blue Hole is an ingenious artesian well that was used as a fish hatchery in 1932 by the National Fish Hatchery. It's a deep sinkhole that has cracked caverns which led to the uncovering of the groundwater underneath. The formation of caverns was from limestone bedrock and this bedrock began to disintegrate because of the constant impact of the underground water. The underground water hewed a hollow into the rock, which continued to expand and made the rock above become thinner until the ceiling of the rock caved in, forming a cavern. While you're diving through this cavern, you'll see an entrance at the bottom of the cave. This entrance leads to a complex network of winding passageways that's difficult to navigate without getting lost. Don't try entering into it, you may not find your way back to the surface. It's as complex as that. Also, at the bottom of the cave, there are big boulders, rubble, bones, masks, and a crucifix, among many other things that were found during an exploration of the cave. The cave is about 194 feet deep. It's meant for those who are ready to push their limits in cave diving and who are prepared to face any difficulties within it. The water springs out from the rubble at the bottom of the cavern. This cavern likely has connections with one of the U.S.'s longest explored caverns, Carlsbad Caverns, according to a folktale. The main above-ground entrance to the Carlsbad Cavern system is more than 200 miles away from the Blue Hole. It's quite amazing that the Blue Hole Caves are possibly connected to this faraway cavern. Because of inexperienced cave divers that always wanted to explore these underground passageways, a metal grate was fixed at the passageways to prevent access in 1976. This was an action taken after two lives of student divers were taken in this cave. The ADM Exploration Foundation, a nonprofit organization, took permission from the community to explore the cave for surveying and mapping this cave. The metal grate that was initially used to seal up the caves was removed for the exploration to begin in 2013. The exploration continued until 2016, before the incident of Shane Thompson during the exploration. Many times there is zero visibility within these passageways because of the abundance of silt that is most likely kicked up during exploration. Another hazard that could be encountered in this cave is what is called caving in. This means that divers are likely to be closed within the cave by rocks while exploring the chambers of the cave. 
All of these together, with many other restrictions within the passageways, were the reasons the community stopped divers from accessing the cave. Shane Thompson, age 43, was a veteran scuba diver. He grew up in Florida, where he started learning to dive as a young boy. Shane worked with a construction company that deals with underwater construction. He did several diving businesses, such as boat maintenance, salvage work, and training. He was a renowned scuba diving instructor for advanced underwater training. He also worked with the Navy as their diving instructor. Shane was part of many recovery operations of divers who died in underwater caverns. He recovered Stephen Donathan's body, a veteran diver of Ocean Beach, after being trapped in sunken warship Yukon in 2005. And also in the year 2012, he was the team leader of an adventure to search for a diver declared missing around La Jolla shores during a Memorial Day swim. On March 26, 2016, Shane Thompson and Mike Young, who were members of the two-man adventure with the ADM Exploration Foundation, went into the caverns of the Blue Hole Lagoon. What was their dive purpose? The purpose of the adventure was to give more accessibility to the maze-like caverns while mapping them out. This endeavor requires professional divers due to its dangerous system. They were using rebreather gear that recycled the diver's breath with oxygen as it allowed them to stay underwater for a long time. The caverns had been under restrictions since 1976 when two student divers from Oklahoma died in the lagoon. But since Shane and Mike were not individual divers but were part of a team and are professionals, they were allowed to embark on this dangerous exploration. This mapping adventure stretched out from 2013 till the tragedy occurred in 2016. When they dove in, Shane and Mike went as deep as 194 feet into the water in a narrow cave. This is when things went horribly wrong. Mike began to leave the narrow cavern area while following a safety line, but he had kicked up silt, which caused zero visibility. In the meantime, Shane strongly pulled the line so hard that Mike lost control of it. Both divers were crammed into the little tube as Shane emerged from below as he felt for the line in the dark. Mike swam back down to turn around, but Shane kept on going up and went in the opposite direction due to the poor visibility. He became stuck in what was described as an unmapped branch that went in the wrong direction. By the time Mike reached the region where Shane was trapped, Shane was already lying dead. On the following day, his body was recovered and brought to the surface. According to a Santa Rosa police officer, Mike Guana, in an interview with the Guadalupe County communicator, Shane was supposed to stay out and for whatever reason entered the cave. This broke the heart of Mike Young, and he stated that the caves are too insecure for diving expenditures. He advised that it be sealed up again. He also recommended to the officials of the city that they should not grant access to anyone going into these caves at the Blue Hole Lagoon. He concluded that the caverns were the most hazardous place they've ever dived. The city officials later instructed the Associated Press through ABC News that there will not be further exploration or surveying of these cave systems. Due to this incident, the metal grate that was previously used to block the cave was returned to prevent any future access into the cave. Shane Thompson's family members greatly missed their beloved Thompson and found it difficult to accept the reality of his death. However, they consoled themselves with the fact that he died in the course of pursuing his life's ambition as a diver. Diving wasn't just a profession for Shane. It was what he loved till he drew his last breath. Due to his passion, Shane had many certifications in diving before his death. This was the fifth cave diving marathon on this channel. Let us know what you think in the comments section. If you enjoyed watching, take a dive on the like and subscribe buttons and hit the bell icon so you get notified when we come back with another exciting cave diving story.